So now let's plug this into the differential equation to see how they behave. All right. So let's say let's look at the first term first. The first term is partial u partial t. Now with the Fourier series, what is partial u partial t? Can somebody tell me? Do I still have this summation? Yes. The summation is still minus infinity to infinity. And uh, how would the u head of k change? Becomes the derivative of u hat k. Now we have the ordinary derivative because u hat of k only depends on time. And how does the exponential change? No, they don't, right? Because they only depend on x, they don't depend on t. Okay, so we have the first term expanded. We can say it's another Fourier series, right? And ho we hope the same thing happens for the spatial derivative because with that we can we can basically match the terms and uh, figure out how the u hat of case evolve. So when we look at the Fourier series of that, this time would the u hat of k be any different? No, because they are functions of only time. They are not functions of space. But how would the exponential of jkx change? Yes, we're taking the derivative of an exponential twice. Each time, we have are still the exponential here, but a factor of jk comes out of the exponential when you take the derivative. So jk squared would be minus 1 times k squared. So minus 1 times k squared comes out because of the second derivative, and we still have here. Now. It's time to match the terms, right? We know that this thing plus kappa, actually not plus kappa, equal to kappa times this thing, right? So we know that du hat k dt. That's the nice thing about Fourier series, right? Fourier, in Fourier series, you can basically multiply the whole series by the same e to the jkx and integrate, you just uh, got out of the coefficient, right? So all the, if, if two se Fourier series are equal, then each term actually has to be equal. That's uh, so equal to minus k squared times u hat of k, okay? And that is for any k, for all. So we can see a bunch of things from this equation. Because now, instead of a partial differential equation, we get a, a set, we get an infinite set of ordinary differential equations. And I hope you have an intuitive understanding of how an ordinary differential equation like this would behave. Do you? Yes? Um, what happened to the k that was with the uh, partial q, partial x Oh, here we are analyzing a limiting case one parabolic equation where the big U term uh, is set to zero. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I missed uh, a kappa here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, minus kappa times k squared. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, a anytime I do something wrong, please point out. It's very helpful because... Uh, uh, it will help everybody. So, what's the behavior of this ordinary differential equation? Yes. So it's decaying exponential? It decays exponentially, right. Well, uh, depend on the sign of kappa, right? You, you are going to notice in all the experiments we did, I never set kappa to a negative number. Now you know, know the reason. So if kappa is a negative number, they will, instead of decay exponentially, they will grow exponentially. And especially for the large case, because k can go all the way to infinity, right? If I have a large k, it'll go to infinity exponentially, I mean, very fast. So I won't see any solution. If I, the moment I lift my pen from the surface, I won't see any solution, <laughs> right? So, so kappa has to be zero or positive for the solution to be well behaved. So that's one thing. Second thing is the different case 
decays at different rates. So what k would decay faster? What k would decay slower? Large k decays faster. Large k decays way faster, way faster than small k's. It's square, right? Not linear. Okay. So so if I have function two as my initial condition, all these wiggles are going to be gone pretty quickly because these <coughs> terms decay pretty quickly. If I have function one as my initial condition, we'll see it'll decay pretty slowly. So let's look at again uh, from here. Let's try to draw function two it's like this, right? Okay, we see it becomes smooth very quickly. All the high frequency terms, they are gone very quickly. They decay exponentially. Let's try again if I have a very smooth function. Slow, it's actually moving, right? But you have to stare at it to actually see it's moving. Right, so this is uh, how the behavior of the different case are going to do uh, according to this equation. All right, and another thing is, so let's try a much bigger coefficient. Let's do 10. Another thing is whatever equation, whatever initial condition you draw, I mean, this time it decays very quickly, but then you get a constant. Why is a constant not moving? Can somebody explain f the fact from this equation? Just determine the constant term at k equal to zero term. k equal to zero term, exactly. When k is equal to zero, the zero term e to the jkx is a constant, right? So the constant term never decays because k squared is equal to zero. All right, so all the behavior of this equation can be analyzed uh, through the Fourier series. Right, any questions about this? No? Yes? Uh, what is K is the index in this infinite summation, which is a Fourier series. So why does it not mean that When K is equal to zero, corresponds to a particular term in this infinite series, in the Fourier series, right? So, so what we are saying is that Initially, u0 may be composed of many, many different terms. And if I have a large kappa, all the terms, all the terms corresponding to k equal to 1, k equal to 2, k equal to minus 1, as long as k is not equal to 0, they get decayed very fast. So after some time, I won't even see these terms on the screen. The only remaining term that wouldn't decay corresponds to k equal to 0. So after some time, what you're going to see is that uh, still infinite summation, but the infinite summation has almost zero components in all terms other than the k equal to zero term. What function is that? It's a constant. And that's what we see here. Right? What we see here is that uh, u hat of zero is roughly equal to 0 0.3. 